Hey everyone, welcome to the first episode of Game Audio Theory and today we're talking about this book and how audio works to immerse us in video games. So through visuals and audio, video games create this illusion, an illusion that we happily fall for. When we're playing, we know that it's all make-believe or pretend, yet we're all the more happy to be tricked by it in the moment. But why exactly is this? What is it about the audio specifically that convinces us of this immersion? Video games are this beautiful form of media that convince us that we're in this dramatic new world or larger than life adventure. And they do this mainly through the use of image, sound, and our direct agency. Through these techniques, they trick us into believing we are really in this new world, at least momentarily. And although the emotions we feel whilst playing these games are very much real, they still come from this overall illusion. Our acceptance or agreement to this illusion is otherwise known as the audiovisual contract. In Michel Chion's book, Audio Vision, he explains exactly what this phenomenon is. Back in the year 1990, where Solid Snake was dialing in radio frequencies, Mario learned how to ride Yoshi, and somehow, yes, somehow, Dirty Harry made its way into a side-scrolling NES title, this French composer, filmmaker, and theoretician dedicated himself to releasing his book, Audio Vision. This book seeks out to define what this audiovisual phenomenon is, to better understand the impact audio has in visual media, like video games. And although this book focuses on film and television, a lot of the definitions are still very relevant when talking about video game examples. Now, back to the audiovisual contract. Xion describes this as a sort of symbolic pact that the audio spectator, or the player, agrees to before they watch a movie or experience a video game. Easiest way to exemplify this is to talk about boxing. Now, boxing punches in real life sound something like this. But in Rocky Balboa movies, we're happy to accept that these punches can sound like cannonballs and explosions instead. Rocky's hurt. He woke the sleeping giant and now he's Another example is wind. In real life, when we're caught in a storm or windy weather, the air literally hits against our eardrums, causing this horrible, distorted, bassy sound. However, this doesn't create a very enjoyable experience for a viewer who naturally accepts the sound of more distant wind instead as a more appropriate illusion. Okay, so now why is any of this important? Why should you care? How does it relate to your sound design or your musical compositions? Well, I'll explain. I see a lot of student work where they simply describe the visuals of a scene. Quite straightforward, mimicking what's on the screen. So every footstep or movement or attack is described with a fairly straightforward and appropriate sound which is fine, but it's not very exciting. It does nothing to extend the imagination of the player. Here's a really quick example of that in action for a sound effect that I designed for a video game. In this scene, we have the player activating an elevator with a lever system. Now, we can simply describe the mechanics as old and rusted, which is what we've done. And then to add a little bit more imagination to the scene, I added some distant metal moans as well. Very subtle, but it gives the illusion that the player is influencing more than what they think, creating a little bit more sense of imagination. In a similar example, when the elevator starts moving, I describe the mechanics in a very straightforward and obvious way, especially highlighting how old and rickety it was. And then on top of that, I added two more layers with subtle processed monster growls. <laughs> And what this does is extend the narrative that everything in this game world is threatening this player in a very subtle way. Our audio work doesn't simply duplicate and mimic what the visuals do, but it adds value to the scene. We're telling the story of every single action that audio is attached to. What's the story behind it? What does it communicate to the player? How should they feel about it? In Zelda, we're reminded of the colorful and vibrant visual style with musical and playful sound. 
or in God of War, we are reminding the player that every action is reinforced by magic and godlike power behind it. And in Ghost of Tsushima, we're not simply describing sword fights, but reminding the player of the fluidity and grace of a samurai's movement. Having this notion and idea in my head before I start any sort of sound design or musical practice helps my creativity no end. A little reminder that we don't have to be so literal with our sound work and that we can afford to push the excitement and imagination of the player by describing a little bit more than what's visually there. So next time you're designing sounds for a scene, remember about this audio-visual contract that players agree to. It'll add a whole new dimension to the sounds that you're creating. Moreover, I highly recommend that you buy this book. It's not an easy read, but it's essential reading for any composer and sound design out there, in my humble opinion. And I've linked it in the description below. Even if you take this and learn one new idea like this video has just explained, it'll be worth your time and money. And finally, if you want to convince me to make more videos like this, please leave a quick comment below. It's how the algorithm works. It's how I'm gonna attract more people and hopefully teach others this really cool, useful information. And if you're new to the industry and wanna find out how to work as a sound designer or composer, then subscribe to my mailing list in the description below. I have a free e-course about just that subject.